Anticoagulants are drugs that prevent or reduce the coagulability of the blood. One thing to remember is that they cannot break the clot or thrombus once it is formed. It can only be used as a preventive measure. We use anticoagulants in deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, my myocardial infarction to prevent recurrent attacks of MI and stroke, in unstable angina to decrease the MI occurrence, in atrial fibrillation which causes stasis of blood in the atria which can lead to thrombus formation, mural thrombus actually, disseminated intravascular coagulation in some cases, in dialysis to prevent thrombosis in the blood circuit, in cardiac bypass surgery and in pr prosthetic heart valves to decrease the thromboembolism. Now a brief recap of coagulation cascade before we see the drugs that act on it. We had the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway was activated by any negative charge surface. It basically acts on the factor 12 and converts it into factor 12A, which in turn converts 11 into 11A, which will convert 9 into 9A. Now this factor 9A along with factor 8A will act on factor 10 to convert it into the active form that is 10A. Another way this factor 10 can be converted into 10A is when the extrinsic pathway is activated. The tissue factor is exposed by any injury to the endothelium which converts 7 into 7A and both 7A and tissue factor can then act on factor 10 to convert it into factor 10A. This factor 10A will then in association with factor 5A act on prothrombin which is basically factor 2 and convert into thrombin which is factor 2A. The thrombin or factor 2A will then act on fibrinogen which is soluble and convert it into insoluble fibrin and thus the clot formation is started. Coming to the classification of anticoagulant drugs, they can be used in vitro, in the lab and in vivo inside the body. The in vitro used anticoagulant drugs include heparin, sodium citrate, sodium oxalate and sodium edetate. Sodium citrate is mainly used in blood banks to store the blood. Sodium oxalate and sodium editate are used in the laboratories. Now, our main concern is the in vivo drugs, which are further divided into heparin and related products, direct thrombin inhibitors, direct factor 10 inhibitors, and lastly, warfarin and cumarin derivatives. The heparin and related products are also known as indirect thrombin inhibitors, which will be very clear in a moment when I explain the mechanism. These are given IV. Direct thrombin inhibitors can be given parenterally and orally. Direct factor 10 inhibitors can be given parenterally and orally and warfarin is only given orally. There are many differences between heparin and warfarin which will be clear at the end of this video. So we have heparin that is unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin such as enoxaparin, deltiparin, tenzaparin, ardiparin, reviparin etc. And we have synthetic uh, heparin compounds such as fondaparinux. Then direct thrombin inhibitors include lepirodin, bivalirudin, ergetroban, and
and Debbie Gatron. Direct factor 10 inhibitors include rivaroxaban and apixaban. While the warfarin derivatives are warfarin and dicumarol and acenocumarol. Heparin is a sulfated mucopolysaccharide and is, it is the strongest organic acid. It can be neutralized by protamine sulfate in cases of toxicity, which is a strong base. The mechanism of action of heparin is, it basically binds to endogenous antithrombin 3, which is a serin protease inhibitor, via a key pentasaccharide sequence, and thus make it more active. It is basically an accelerator of thrombin degradation and makes thrombin and other active factors such as 10A, 2A, 9A, 11A and 12A more prone to degradation. It has a dose dependent action. At low dose it inhibits the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. At high doses it has an antiplatelet action and it also releases lipoprotein lipase and thus is responsible for the hydrolysis of TAGs and clear plasma of lipids. During heparin therapy, the activated partial thromboplastin time or APTT, which is basically a screening test that helps to evaluate a person's ability to appropriately form blood clots, should be monitored and should be maintained at 1.5 to 2.5 times the control. It is safe in pregnancy and when it is administered in IV infusion, it has an immediate action. It should not be given orally because it has a high negative charge and increased size. And it should also not be given intramuscularly because it will cause hematoma formation. Some side effects of unfractionated heparin include bleeding, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, hypersensitivity reactions, osteoporosis, and reversible alopecia. It should not be given in hemophilia patients, intracranial hemorrhage, threatened abortion, cirrhosis, renal failure, hypertension, active TB, and bacterial endocarditis. The low molecular weight heparins are formed by fractionation of the standard heparin. They are administered subcutaneously. The mechanism of action is basically by inhibition of factor 10A through antithrombin, same as the unfractionated heparin, but they do not have uh, any effect on thrombin inhibition. They do not need any APTT monitoring, although renal failure patients might need it. And in case of toxicity, uh, it cannot be reversed by protamine sulfate. There is decreased risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and osteoporosis. They have a long half-life. Lastly, the synthetic form or Fonda Perinox, it also binds to antithrombin and selectively inhibits factor 10A with no effect on thrombin. It has a long half-life with 17 hours of 17 hours. There is also low risk of HIT and osteoporosis. It's given subcutaneously. Its actions are also not reversed by protamine sulfate, should not be given in renal failure patients, and no APTT monitoring is required. Coming to the direct thrombin inhibitors, as is evident from their name, they directly bind to thrombin and directly inhibit the thrombin and not bind to antithrombin. The first drug is lepirudin. It's used in cases if patient has heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. It is given IV and APTT mon monitoring should be there and there is no antidote in cases of poisoning or overdose. Secondly, bevalirudin is same as lepirudin but reversible. It is given IV as well. Ergatroban is rapid and short acting given as IV infusion. It will cause HIT 
and APTT monitoring is required. Debigatrin is given orally and it causes reversible inhibition of thrombin and no monitoring is required. Coming to the direct factor 10 inhibitors, first is Revaroxaban which is given orally, no APTT monitoring is required. It is as efficacious as low molecular weight heparins. Uh, side effects can include bleeding, tachycardia, blood pressure will go down, etc. Lastly, we have warfarin. The mechanism of action of how warfarin acts is basically vitamin K in its inactive form when it needs to be converted to its active form that's done by an enzyme known as epoxide reductase. So warfarin inhibits this enzyme competitively and thus vitamin K is stuck in its inactive form and there is no production of factor 2, 7, 9 and 10 which need to be carboxylated at their glutamic acid residues to be able to bind calcium and thus coagulate. The half-lives of the preformed clotting factors will tell us why there is a delay in onset of warfarin action. The clotting factor 2 has a half-life of 50 hours, 7 has a half-life of 6 hours, 9 has a half-life of 24 hours and factor 10 has a half-life of 36 hours. So before these preformed uh, clotting factors are not used up, warfarin, warfarin's action which is acting at the synthesis level will not show. So there is a delay in onset but a prolonged action is there for about 2 to 5 days. It also has a long half-life of about 40 hours. In cases of warfarin therapy, we need to monitor the INR, which is basically the international normalized ratio. It is the ratio between the prothrombin time of the patient and that of a reference. Warfarin has teratogenic properties so it is contraindicated in pregnancy, it can cross the placenta and it also causes skin necrosis. 